often in other settler colonial spaces. So I don't see this work and me being censured for talking about this as like removed from other work that is important here. And as much as people will continue to say, as much as I've been told over the last month, like, why do you care so much about this one issue? It's not really related to your role or what you should be caring about. Like, as a Muslim, but also as an organizer who cares about black liberation, I cannot understand or fathom wanting to fight for the liberation of my people here, but not tying that to a global context of people who are being oppressed around the world. So I wanted to begin there by contextualizing who I am and like why I think this is important as someone who's had a lot of people speaking for me and about me, including the premier, without actually asking me why I said what I said, firstly. <laughs> the rest of what I want to say is this. I think as someone who's not academic and who's gotten involved in this conversation over and over again, I was pretty, I struggled a lot with watching politicians that I know and some that I don't know respond so quickly publicly when the attacks from Hamas occurred without contextualizing the struggle of Palestinians before that. I think when I put up my statement, I waited three entire days. The media will have you believe that I put up a statement immediately and I refused to condemn Hamas. That is not what happened. I waited three days and by the time the statement went up, white phosphorus was being used, the rocket border was closed, food and water were being withheld, and anybody who was paying attention could see the genocidal attempt, like, intention around what was about to happen. And for those three days, like a lot of us in this room, I, I really couldn't sleep. And I couldn't fathom not saying anything. And watching even leftists only put up things along the line of just standing with Israel, just standing with the oppressor at that time. So I put up a statement. And the statement I put up was very fair. <laughs> it, 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 it quoted Michael Link, who I never thought I would meet, also. <laughs> it was just some guy who wrote a report. Truthfully, I wasn't sure if you were not alive or not. Like, I, <laughs> and not disputable. And what people will focus on is the omission of what they believe is an omission, actually, and not condemning Hamas. But the intention of my statement that I put out was to draw attention to the voices that were missing from that conversation throughout that entire three days. Um, and I saw that as my role. As somebody who, during my campaign, the Zionist lobby came after me for my involvement in BDS on my campus, and for other things I had said around the right for Palestinian, the right to self-determination for, for Palestinians. And then being elected and then being told to unretweet a statement that a very well-known Palestinian scholar had written about a Palestinian who was killed in indefinite detention through a hunger strike. I had to like unshare that and I had to apologize. I'm somebody who's had to apologize numerous times for basic information that I've shared. And so this one time that I spoke about what was going on in Gaza, I was like, okay, this is a very basic statement. What I said was factual and put a lot of time into it. And it still ended up pulling up into, you don't believe in Israel's right to defend itself, you support Hamas, you're a terrorist. A lot of language that was also shrouded in deep Islamophobia um, throughout that time. And so, Immediately after that statement went up, I was yeah, yeah, reprimanded very yeah, publicly, no. um, asked to delete my statement, and I think in choosing not to delete my statement and to stand by what I said, I was thinking a lot about all the Palestinians right now who are losing their jobs here, um, trying to fight for people back home, um, who, are, who are facing greater risk at, at saying what they need to say in order to draw attention to the violence that's going on, the violence that's impacting them. And so I chose not to delete the statement. Um, and then the Ford government somehow 
put out that I was supporting the rape of women, all these things that weren't actually in my statement. And so I think this draws a greater picture in terms of like the ability for a government to be influenced by the Zionist lobby because it has been disproven publicly. Like the IDF themselves has said there's no actual evidence of these rapes and the babies with their heads cut off. Like all these things are pieces of misinformation. Um, so I think this shows the strength of the Zionist lobby here in Canada and the ways in which they're able to pressure an entire government operation to censure me indefinitely until I apologize. We've seen in the United States um, the only Palestinian congresswoman to have been elected was also just censured yesterday, but even then, she's still able to have her speaking rights in the House, she's still able to, to vote. The censure just means that she's going to be publicly condemned in the House. Here in Canada, what the censure vote means is that I can never speak at Queen's Park, I can never um, represent my constituents, I can vote, but I can't actually talk or participate. Uh, so it's really taking away the, the rights of 50,000 people that I represent in my writing. It's a complete breach of freedom of speech, but it's also showing the lengths at which um, like our current government will go to support the fascist ideology that like, if you are not saying something completely in line with what they're pushing for you to say, you can just be silenced completely or your rights can be taken away. And I think that sets a very dangerous precedent um, for our government, but also for everybody taking on this fight wherever you are, whether you're a lawyer, or you're a student, everybody who's scared to speak up about the right thing or to just give basic context like I had done about the struggle. The last thing I'll say about what's been going on in the last month is I'm very deeply uncomfortable with the level of focus that has gone on from the media on this specific issue of censorship without coverage of what's going on in Gaza and Palestine as a whole. Um, it, it's very uncomfortable to grapple with the ways media will sensationalize the fact that I put up a statement, a very basic statement, there's more to have been said other than what I said, and not actually interview or take time to talk to Palestinians, both people back home. I think everybody here who's looking for a way to contribute back to the fight back home should message your MPPs and your MPs on all levels of government, um, because it is important. We saw all levels of government participate when this was, when this fight was about the Iraq war. But now all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's not the right level of government, this isn't our focus. Every single party and every single person who has some sort of elected power right now should be pushing for a ceasefire immediately because there's no excuse to not say something or to wait for the right number of people to die in order to say the right thing and what's important. If everybody had been calling for a ceasefire three days after the Hamas attacks, Maybe people would be alive right now. And so we don't have time to continue to wait. And I would implore every single person, even if you don't believe in the government's capacity to do much, to be pressuring your elected officials, because it is working. With